Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to the fourth live semi-final of Toys Have Got Talent. That one's probably going to wear a bit thin by the time we get to the sixteen. Good morning, ladies customs. and gentlemen. I'm going to have to think of something uh, new welcome, for that. Well, welcome, welcome to, to the fourth uh, live semi-final of Toys Have Got Talent. This is the fourth of that the one's probably going to wear a bit thin by the time we get to the sixteen. We had Birmingham on Saturday. Think of something uh, new for that. that. Well, um, there was a digital hustings uh, on Tuesday, Exeter, born with yesterday, and, and then tomorrow, the immediately after this, we're going to Carlisle, the two candidates tomorrow are taking morning, party. then Manchester we tomorrow had afternoon, on Saturday, Belfast on Tuesday. Um, so I don't think anyone can say that they've been born with yesterday, yesterday, and then tomorrow, immediately after tell you the format of Carlisle, what's going to happen today. Morning, then Manchester, um, Boris Johnson will speak first, Jeremy Hunt second, they'll speak for up to seven minutes, then I will interview them all for about both of them for ten minutes. Now let me tell you the format, it's over to you for questions. Now, the questions um, have been Johnson submitted in advance. Jeremy Hunt second. I've selected I'll speak those for up to seven I've minutes. No interference from then anyone I will CCH interview them all for about entirely for ten minutes. Uh, my choice and of then questions. It's over to you um, for questions. I will follow now, up. The questions have been submitted in advance. In as much I've selected those questions. I've had no done. interference from anyone um, The event is being streamed live my choice of Facebook page and Twitter I will follow up. I think Sky News and possibly BBC are also taking it. It's also a bit of a family affair because we have Stanley Johnson. Is being streamed live on the Facebook page and Twitter feed. I think it's going to be even possibly the BBC. And we have Jeremy's sister and his nephews and nieces. It's a family affair because we have Stanley Johnson with us today. So the reason I wanted to introduce them is to ensure that there's no doing. And we have Jeremy's sister. You look a very polite audience. 
So we have a warm-up act before we hear from Boris Johnson. And so the reason I wanted to introduce them the is to ensure Party that national no convention doing. Please give him, you, look a, you look a very yourself. polite audience. So we have a warm-up act before we hear from Boris Johnson. And his name is Andrew Sharp. He's chairman of the Conservative Thank you very Party much National indeed, Convention. Um, Please yeah, give him a warm welcome. There's Andrew no Sharp. pressure there. <laughs> um, so as Ian said, I'm Andrew Sharp. I'm chairman of the National Convention. And it's an honour and privilege to welcome you here today to this third of the physical Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, um, yeah. um, um, for our leadership no candidates around there. the country. <laughs> Um, so, as Ian said, I'm Andrew Sharp, I'm chairman of the National um, Convention. It was it's packed yesterday in Bournemouth, as, as some of you know, because I saw some of you there the too. Um, and it's great yeah, to see the, the um, membership for our leadership candidates around the country. Massive scale and it's great to see so many exercise. people here. Um, Not least because it was actually packed yesterday in Bournemouth, as some of you have seen. I saw some very positive commentary coming out of the Birmingham And it's great to see the membership of the party engaging in such a massive scale with us, including the accolade from the Not least because it's actually very good news that were asked were spot on. You will have seen some very positive commentary and that will help to dispel the typical media narrative about our host members of our party, including. But of course, the media are here, as Ian says. So questions that were in order to prevent unflattering pictures, ladies and gentlemen, that's very good news, and that will help to dispel the typical. Media narrative about us um, and members look, of the party that I and my but of national course, the convention officers know, and, said, so and the one that we see in order every to week as we travel around the country, is made up of engaged men and engaging <laughs> women. Of every um, colour, faith, look, the party that I and my national convention are all united know, by their and the one that we see in our country. every week as we travel um, around the country. There are is made up of engaged men and, and engaging and unshakable women of every colour, faith, service. age. They're also, of course, um, they're all united admirably by their belief to in our country. party in all weathers. Um, there and I've never met anybody in our party who cares where you come from. We don't care where you're going. Tradition of public and that's really important. There are also far more that unite um, us than divide us. Admirably committed. And as Lord Hailsham said, conservatism is not so much a philosophy. And I've never met anybody in our party who cares where you come from. We don't care where you're a timeless function in the development of a free society. far more that unites us than divides us. So we're here to undertake a solemn duty of conservatism to a free society. Because we're not just electing a party leader, we're electing a prime minister. We're forming a timeless function. In the country we love, we expect us to ensure that this process is rigorous. So we're here to undertake to a solemn sure duty as part of But we need a Prime Minister who will deliver Brexit because we're not just elected political opponents. We're electing a Prime Minister. And those of us who knock on doors week in and week out know, know that, that many of our opponents are far less committed to that free society than we are. But we need a Prime Minister who will deliver So we made the case at the party board that the leadership campaign had to reach every part of the United Kingdom and that all members should have access to at least one hostage. And there really was no disagreement about that. So at this point, I'd like to thank the party So we made the case at the party board that the leadship campaign had to reach every part of the United Kingdom. And I'd also actually like to thank him more generally here for his support of the voluntary party. Um, in that, he's been very consistent, and we enjoy far more resources than we have done for many years, and that's in large part down to him. I'd also like to thank the logistics team at CCHP, led by Tom Skinner, who um, in that, he's been very consistent. And also the conferences team, led by David Cumberland. They have done a fantastic job in a very short period of time. I know that there's been some, some disquiet on one or two WhatsApp groups, but as you can imagine, organising all these hustings is massive. And also the conferences team. And finally, I'd like to thank your regional team, led by Peter Booth, the regional chairman. As you'll know, Peter is a tireless advocate for the South West um, and is deservedly held in very, very high regard. And so before I hand over, just one last thing. You will have seen on your chairs when you came in um, adverts for the campaign manager's program. As you'll know, Peter is Can you please take a moment to read that and please do engage with it? Um, as you may or may not know, but where we have campaign so before managers, I hand over, we do generally you do better. On your chairs when you came in, um, where we don't, we don't do as well. Um, but this is a hugely expensive undertaking. And at the moment, we're rather overly reliant on others to help us pay for to help ourselves. Where we don't, um, it'd be very good if you could engage. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back over. Um, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Enjoy your morning and make sure your questions are spot on. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back over. Thank you very Ladies and gentlemen, it's time morning. to welcome Thanks contestant number one, I'm Boris Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to welcome contestant number one, Boris Johnson. Well, how are you? Morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Well, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you very much. Ian, good morning, everybody. I, I speak as somebody of course. Well, how are you? Morning, everybody. Uh, morning. Up on a ex morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It was. Uh, who learnt to swim in the X, still goes shopping from time to time in, in X therefore it's absolutely wonderful to be here. In, in Exeter, the 
other end of the river, here in the West Country. Now, look, folks, I know there are some people who say that our party is in a bad way. And there are some people who point out that uh, we are on, I think, about 17, 18, 19 points in the polls, depending on which one you look at. And indeed, it was very disappointing that in the most recent national election, we scored 9%. I don't think I've known a time when our party has got 9% in a national uh, election. And it is also true that we have two other parties who are profiting from our difficulties in the sense that we have the Brexit Party and the Liberal Democrats, like two opportunistic puffballs feeding <laughs> saprophytically on the sense of decay in trust in politics that is going on at the moment. And uh, I, I acknowledge that we have all these, uh, all these problems, but I say to you that the hour is darkest before the dawn, my friends. And we can turn this thing round, and we can go forward to win. We really, really can. And there are just three things that we need to do and three things that we need to get right. And number one, the first and most important thing you need to do in the next few months is what? It is to get Brexit done and come out of the EU on October the 31st. That is right, on the 31st. Let's get it done. Let's get going. And everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows the rough shape of the deal that we have to do. We have to be very friendly to our uh, European Union nationals, 3.2 million who are here in this country. Let's take uh, that part of the withdrawal agreement, the otherwise defunct withdrawal agreement, put it into law and treat them in the way we should have treated them three years ago. Number two, let's take the money, the 39 billion, and put it in a state of, uh, let's say, uh, creative ambiguity uh, suspended over the, over the negotiations until such time as we get what we want. Uh, and let's take the questions of the Irish backstop and how to solve the problems of uh, frictionless borders at, uh, at, um, in all run, and indeed in every uh, border between the UK and the rest of the EU. Let's remit all that quite sensibly for resolution in the context of the free trade agreement that we're going to strike with our friends and partners after we come out on October the 31st. That's what we're going to do. And it's a, it's a very, very simple. And there's a way to, there's a way to ensure that we, we, we get that done, and that is, of course, to prepare to come out on WTO terms, to, to prepare to get ready to come out on no deal. And this is a great country, isn't it? Yeah. It's a fantastic country. We can do it. We can get ready. And, of course, there are some people who will say that the UK is simply not capable of coming out on no deal. And I've heard people argue that the planes won't fly and there won't be any drinking water, and, indeed, that there won't be any glucose or, or milk solids or whey to provide the, the, the children of this country with Mars bars. And I, well, I, want to, I want you to know that whatever happens on November the 1st, whatever, whatever deal we strike, uh, the planes will fly. And there will be drinking water. And there will be not only glucose and milk solids, but there will be way for our, for our children to eat in their Mars bars. Where there's a will, there's a way, uh, my friends. Uh, you can see that one. You can see that one coming. And when, we, and when we've done that, we will be able to take forward a great modern, progressive, conservative agenda and unite our country. And, and very, very simply, what I want to do as, as your Prime Minister is to bring this country together in the way that I was able to bring London together from during the eight years that I ran it. And when I began, uh, just to remind you, we had four of the six poorest boroughs in the whole of the UK. When I ended, we had none of the poorest 20. That was because we invested in transport infrastructure, because we cut crime. Uh, very considerably, uh, because we boosted education across the city, and that is what we are going to do with the whole of the UK, starting, of course, in the southwest, yeah. improving, yeah. improving our... And isn't it time the A303 was modernised and, and, and dual? I, frankly, I think... Thank you, I'm glad you agree. I've been driving it for about 50 years, and it's absolutely... It's absolutely, it's absolutely incre incredible that it should, should remain substantially the same. We need to... funding uh, needs to be levelled up around I Do you not agree? I think it's quite extraordinary that, uh, that parts of rural England have failed to keep pace uh, with provision, per capita provision for education. So what the first thing we're going to do, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, we level up education funding around this country. Third thing, third thing we need to do is, of course, to make sure to make sure that everywhere in this country has proper full fibre broadband. It is an utter disgrace. An utter disgrace that there are parts of rural Spain that have speed of light access to the internet, many parts of rural uh, England, rural Britain, uh, that where people are staring at the revolving pizza wheel of doom, unable, uh, no, no confidence. And, and if we get all these things done, get it done fast, then, of course, that will drive business investment, it will drive growth, it will drive productivity, and, important. and, of course, it will enable us uh, to invest yet more through the tax revenues that we produce in fantastic public services such as the NHS, 
such as defence and all the things that we care about. And that is the symmetry at the heart of our modern conservative vision. It's a very, very simple idea. And we need to get it across with a new clarity, a new power, and a new conviction. And we need to do it because there is one man who stands in the way of the progress of this country, and we all know who he is. He is the leader of a cabal of superannuated Marxists from London. Uh, he's called Jeremy Corbyn. And I don't want him anywhere near the government of this country. Do you want him? Absolutely not. This is a guy who would not only whack up taxes on virtually everything you could think of, from pensions to income to gardens to inheritance to financial transactions in order to pay for his crazed programme of renationalisation. He backs Hamas, he backs Hezbollah, he supports the mullahs of Tehran when it comes to the current dispute over what's going on in the Persian Gulf. And when there were poisonings in Salisbury, Jeremy Corbyn stood up on the side of Vladimir Putin and the Russian state. Do we want this guy in charge of the government of our country? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We can defeat him. And let me just remind you in conclusion that the last time that I had to face an emanation of that weird cabal of, Lo of the London Labour left, I was able to beat them and beat Ken Livingstone when we, our party, was 17 points behind in London. We came from behind to win. We can win again. We must win again. And with your help, we will win again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should we have a nice gentle one to start with? Of course. Yeah, thank you. Any, any, any kind you like. <laughs> a couple of hours Theresa May a couple of hours ago Theresa May met Vladimir Putin in Osaka. What should she have said to him? Would you like to normalise relations with Russia? Do you know, one of the saddest things that, that uh, I, I discovered in, in the Foreign Office is that every uh, British Prime Minister, every Foreign Secretary comes into office, I think in the last 10 years or so, thinking that they can have a, a reset, thinking that they can have a normalisation. I think it goes for Dave, it goes for, for every, every Prime Minister, uh, thinking that they can turn things around. It certainly went for... Uh, for uh, Bill Clinton, me, as, and, and what happens is they try, they try, and Russia always lets you down. And it's so sad. Uh, I wanted to, things to go better in our relations with Russia, but when it comes to something like the, the Skripal poisonings, it's very, very difficult to find any defence or excuse for their behaviour. Using chemical <laughs> weapons on the streets of a place like Salisbury is absolutely inexcusable. And I, I'm sure that that's what uh, Theresa will have said to, uh, to Vladimir Putin, and she's, she's totally right. Uh, one of the things I was, I was proudest of when I, was, when I was Foreign Secretary was actually orchestrating a, uh, a, a global response to what happened in the UK. And we got a total of 28 countries to kick out 153 Russian diplomats. And that's a, that's a lot when you consider that every country that took that, took that risk was going, to be, was going to face retribution from Putin for doing so. So, so uh, I think that was a, a testimony, not just to the, the power of, of, of the UK's influence, but also to the global sense of, of repulsion at the way Russia behaves. A um, couple of questions on Brexit. What's your message to your colleague Dominic Grieve? He says he's going to try and bring government to a halt by using arcane parliamentary procedures yet again uh, to halt government funding for education and welfare benefits. Well, I, I make the same response to Dominic, uh, that I'm, uh, who, who I like in mind, who's been an, 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 <laughs> used to be a neighbour of mine uh, when, he was, when I was in here. I think he can have a different views of that question, obviously, but I think we're coming together now as a party in recognition that we are all basically staring down the barrel of electoral extinction unless we get this thing over the line. And I think that is powerfully concentrating the minds of um, all colleagues in Parliament and indeed colleagues on the Labour benches because, you know, they didn't do that well either. With superhuman incompetence, Jeremy Corbyn actually managed to go backwards in, in the recent <laughs> council elections. Uh, why? Because, because the public can see that Labour is also failing to help get Brexit done and they will continue to punish both of us until we do it on October the 31st. But you have Margot James, the Digital Minister today, in an interview saying that she feels she has more in common with Joe Swinson than she does with you. How well, can you unite know, the party, I, given I, those views? I'm very, I'm very proud that one of the, I think, you know, one of the uh, attractions, I would say, and I must, I must, I must fight, fight down my natural humility 
and bashfulness in, the, in the moments like this, and, and, uh, and, and advertise my, my case to you. I, I command, uh, commanded uh, a couple of weeks ago, much to the surprise of the pundits, the support of, of more than half of the parliamentary party. And I don't think that was what was predicted a, a, a year or so ago, Ian. You know, you, you follow these things incredibly closely, and I don't think people would have forecast that result. And, the, and we, our team now has the backing of powerful, strong uh, Remain campaigners, as well as as dozens of on our side. Then they want to have a deliver that more conservative progressive agenda. And, and that's what we're saying. You've been slightly political on that. Do you want to clear that up? Well, I think Lizzie is right to this. I don't I'm on track to the That's all I want to do. That's the kind of politics I need. I want to be the Prime Minister of a great democracy. And I want to I want to confide in the common sense and the maturity of our MPs to get this thing done. And uh, that's going to be my, my approach. But you know, uh, when it comes to uh, weird devices such as, such as prorogation, I am, I am, I'm certainly not attracted. But you're not gonna, still not going to rule it out? Well, uh, as I think I said last night, uh, you know, uh, there are all sorts of things that uh, remain on the table, but it's a very big and capacious table. I'm not, let me, let me you know, just, and I think people will understand where I'm coming from, I'm not remotely attracted to that kind of uh, device, that kind of fiat by the executive, uh, when really we should be trusting in our MPs to their common sense to get it done. Um, something on the so-called nanny state, the sugar tax, which is, was brought in by the government. The Sun have got a story saying that Number 10 have now put in a green paper that they want milkshakes to be subject to the sugar tax. <laughs> now, now, whether that's to stop a lot more sort of milkshaking of politicians, yeah. I don't know. Um, do, you think, do you think that's to discourage politicians, for people from throwing well, milkshakes at politicians? I wouldn't like I to know. say, but would well. you like to commit now to saving the Great British Milkshake? Well, look, I, 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 I think we, we do face, look, we've got to be realistic. There, there, is, an, there is an obesity problem in, in this country, speaking entirely, entirely personally. Uh, it's something, you know, it's something, we all, it's something we all deal with, we all have to wrestle with, and that we, everybody takes their, 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 has their, has their various motives. Not eating is a very good solution, by the way. Uh, but but, but, but I, I, what I, I'm, I'm very, very reluctant to impose new taxes that fall uh, disproportionately on those on low incomes. And I think you, you need to think very, very carefully about whether you go down this route. Uh, a, a new tax on, on milkshakes seems to me would clobber those uh, particularly who you know, can least afford it. And what we should be doing, if we want kids to lose weight, is make the streets safe, as we did in London, by the way, in case I failed to mention it, cut the murder rate by 50%, uh, encourage p kids to walk and cycle to school, which, which will help them uh, to lose weight as well, and generally take more, ac take more exercise and, and be more active. It's calories in, calories out. I think, I think that, that's a vastly, would you withdraw vastly that proposal? preferable. I don't know whether that proposal will, 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 will live long enough to get on the statute but okay. before there is a change of administration. Um, uh, we, 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 will, we will see. Front page of the Times this morning, um, stamp duty slashed in Johnson no deal budget, Javid offered Chancellor's job, gangbusters yeah, planned for economy, ban on new business red tape. Um, expand. Expand? Uh, I, I, look, I, I, think, I think there's already, look, there's, but, one of the one of the difficulties I'm, I'm discovering in this situation is is obviously that uh, people want to project onto us and onto our, uh, our our agenda all sorts of things that they think are, des are so desirable. So you haven't offered such a chance. They Chancellor. think are desirable, including the possibility that they should be whatever it is. They should have some job or other, and and that is that well, is. So you're accusing Sajid Javid of placing this. Nobody, no, 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 no. But nobody has. I want to be, want to stress. Nobody has been offered a job, okay. nor would that be. But Lord, stamp duty, right. would you like to see stamp duty slashed, reformed? I've said that before. Uh, I do think, so. I look, I mean, SDLT, stamp duty land tax, uh, particularly in, uh, in London, uh, is, is causing huge problems and freezing the property market. I do think it's, I, do think, I don't think it's, I don't think it's got, got the right balance at the moment. I've said, I've, I'm on record of saying that many, many times. But uh, the, our priority, uh, 
I mean, government will be to lift the burden on the poorest and neediest in society. I just remind you what we did in London, where we massively expanded the living wage, which was a really good thing, and was a policy that was nicked by George Osborne in an act of theft I wholly condone, and, and, turned, into, and turned into a national policy, which I think we Conservatives should be very, very proud of. We put millions of pounds in the pockets of, of poorer families across this country, and that is the right thing to do. Did you really call the French turds? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, have no, I have no recollection of this, uh, of, of this, uh, of this, this comment. Um, but, you know, I, I, notice, I notice that um, it is, you know, it is, it's not very well sourced, this story. But anyway. Um, well, it seems to have like come it? from the Foreign Office. <laughs> what do you read into that? Bien je jamais, as we say. Um, <laughs> Uh, in French. Um, I think, I think um, look, the, the, the serious question uh, that perhaps under, underlying all this, and, and, and perhaps what, what everyone wants to know, is uh, can I get a fantastic deal from our country, from our French friends? Can we go forwards in a collegiate, uh, friendly way? And yes, of course, we can. And I just remind you what we, what we did with the French after the Skripal poisonings. They were fantastic. Uh, we will do a, a great deal. Uh, with uh, the French, with the Germans, with all our European friends and partners, and then we'll take this thing forward. And I think if I had, you know, if I had a criticism of, the, of the, um, what's happened in the last three years, we've both been defeatist in our approach to negotiations. I don't know whether you agree with that. Uh, we've, been too, we've been too super. And, and we've sort of, we haven't really stood up. But also, and this is, this is a very important point, We've, we've, we haven't been sufficiently pro-European with a capital E, as it were, as, and setting out what we want from the new partnership and the new rate. This is a, a big opportunity for us. And we want to talk again about bilateral relations. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a sad fact that the teaching of French and German in our schools has massively declined in the 45 years of our EU membership, massively. Uh, people don't, the, the bilateral, when I go to other European capitals, I, I was finding that the bilateral relations uh, in, in those capitals, uh, even in the, the embassies, had been sort of hollowed out. Everything was being done through Brussels. Well, now's our chance to reach out again and to re-engage, not just commercially, but culturally, intellectually, in all sorts of ways. So let's be positive about Europe, but not just through the institutions of the EU. Here's that final quick-fire question that oh politicians God. always dread. Yeah, Tell us one thing about you that we don't know. <laughs> uh, my weight. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I, think the last, I think the last time I looked, it's gone up again. Um, to what? It, I think, it's, I think I'm, I'm about 15 and a half again. 15 cents. And what were you? I was 16 and a half, so I've made progress. But, so that, which is, which is the answer to the milkshake question, by the way. <laughs> right, let's move on to... Uh, that it? Thank God that for is, that. That is it. Um, let's move on to questions from the audience. I'm going to say who we want first, but I'm also going to say who we want second, so they can indicate for the microphone. So the second question um, will be from Annika Friedland. And the first question from Peter Booth. Where is Peter? Yeah. Oh. Good morning, Boris, Good morning, and sir. welcome home to the Great South West. Peter Great Booth, South West. Yes. South West Regional Chairman. At Sorry. the end of this leadership contest, our new leader has to weave our party together into a cloth made of 50 shades of blue. <laughs> Are you the person to do that? Well, I think I, I am. I really do. Thank you, Peter. And listen, just thank you to everybody uh, in the voluntary party to make a success of conservatism in spite of the challenge that we in, in Westminster present to you. And I've got to you know, hold up my hands. You know, we haven't made life easy for, for conservative activists, and, and I want to turn that round. I want to turn that round. And I think actually, even at Westminster, particularly at Westminster, there is a deep yearning now for us to come together and get this thing done. I really think people have had enough of the division. They can see where the threat is, and they can now see where the opportunity is. I mean, the, the, the threat is clear. It's, it's the Brexit Party and the Lib Dems both taking advantage of our failure to get this thing done. And the opportunity is also clear. We had, we've, I'm never in my lifetime have I known such, a, such an ideologically hopeless uh, opponent in, in Jeremy Corbyn. His, his mystic 
uh, appeal simply defeats me. I don't understand it, and it obviously defeats many sections of the UK electorate as well, because he is, he is not prospering. We need to capitalise on that. We need to unite our party, unite our country, and take forward a, a modern conservative agenda. That's what we're going to do. Um, after Annika, we'll go to Fiona Goldsmith. Where is Annika? Oh, right down the front. If Fiona, you can signal where you are for the microphone next time, please. Good morning, Boris. Good morning. Since Iran, with whom we have the nuclear treaty, is the, origi is the originator and sponsor of Hezbollah a terrorist organization, can we trust Iran to allow us full inspection of all urani uranium producing plants in Iran? If so, have sufficient inspections been allowed? Thank you so much. Well, that's a brilliant question. Uh, I think the, 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 the reality is that, uh, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency, they, the, 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 the Iranians are currently compliant with the, with the JCPOA. I mean, they are, they are currently, not, they are currently what they are doing with their, their centrifuges and, uh, and yes, they're, they're, they're pushing at the margins, but they are still technically compliant. Yes, does, yeah, yesterday was that the day that not, they, they were supposed to have gone over their enrichment limit. That does it? not mean, that does not mean that they are to be trusted. And we need to be very, very vigilant about Iran and about that government uh, because they are uh, bent on all sorts of mischief in the region. And actually, I think one of the areas where uh, Donald Trump talks sense, and there, there, are, there are several, by the way, there are many areas where I think, <laughs> I think, I think, I think I, no, seriously, uh, I, I think it is right for us to work both with the Americans and with our European friends to constrain Iran in the region. But also, and I think, that, and I make this point, think about the Iranian population and think about their long-term future. This is a young population. It's a dynamic population. Uh, there are high rates of female literacy, uh, high rates of uh, education, but they're, they're very tech savvy. They, they actually want to engage with us. And we should find ways of getting behind, getting over the, 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 the Mullah's grip on their society and engaging with young people in Iran. That is the future. And if we can do that, uh, the, the, I, I'm much more optimistic about relations. But for the time being, we have to be incredibly vigilant and uh, both about uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions, but also uh, about what they're doing to support Hezbollah uh, and, and many, other, uh, many other causes of insecurity in the region, not least terrorism. Is there any question, though, that if they do breach this limit, which they said they were going to do yesterday, that we will then firmly side with the Americans? Uh, of course. When, if, if we determine that they are in breach of the JCPOA, then clearly the, the, J, the, the, the joint collective points of agreement on, on uh, Iran's nuclear program, then clearly that, that falls away. And I'm afraid that uh, the American scepticism will have been vindicated and we will have to draw the consequences. I think that would be very sad for Iran. I, th I would urge them not to go down that track. I would urge them to continue to show restraint. That's the sensible thing. Okay. Um, Fiona Goldsmith. Um, and then Mike Allen after that. Where's Fiona? Good morning, Boris. Welcome to the Southwest. Um, the government is spending billions of pounds on the Northern powerhouse. What plans do you have to create a Southwestern powerhouse? Between this area. Yes. Well. And London and, and the South East. With the sort of investment in infrastructure and transport the North of England are enjoying. Well, I, I quite agree. Thank you very much. And look, I, this is the great Southwest, and we should, we should be, we should, it is time that we had that kind of focus. And uh, in particular, I want to look, as I've said already, at uh, the A303, at uh, road connectivity. I think uh, the A358 springs to mind, uh, somebody who uses that uh, quite a lot, uh, the A38. Uh, there, are, there are things that we should be doing to improve road connectivity, uh, but also there are things we should be doing, to do with, uh, with, uh, with rail. And um, I just get back to my, my, my key message about 
full fibre broadband. Every home in this country should have full fibre broadband. We should get on and deliver it. And it is utterly, utterly pathetic. If the Spanish can do it, why can't we? No more manana attitude, I say. That's, so let's, let's get on. But, but, we, but you know, there's a serious point, which is that you know, I think a lot, often in, in politics, uh, things can take a life of their own and a momentum of their own if there's, a, if, the, if there's an agenda that everybody buys into. So with the Northern Powerhouse and with West Midlands, I want to be the, the Prime Minister who does for Northern Powerhouse Rail and for connectivity in the, in the West Midlands what we were able to do in London with the tube upgrades and Crossrail. I mean, we massively expanded people's ability. The ability of people on, on, on modest incomes to get to their place of work quickly and, and conveniently. That's how you increase productivity. It's also socially just. It's socially just to do that. And, and, and the South West needs that focus as well. And so I think the, the Great South West program that is being uh, elaborated now is one that we should, we should develop further and, and support very actively indeed. OK. Mike Allen is next, and following him, Amanda Benham. Mike. Good morning, sir. Will you restore ownership of cottage hospitals to the local communities because it's the volunteers who paid for them? And will you ensure that the CCGs and the councils locally rural proof their health and care policies? Well, uh, I can, I, I will, I look, I will, I will, thank you, I will look at the, the ownership uh, structures very carefully, but I think the crucial thing is to, is to make sure that you, we retain good local cottage hospitals and that people uh, have the, that vital service near them. I, I think every MP fights for his uh, or her uh, local provision and, and uh, particularly the cottage hospitals. I remember doing it in, in South Oxfordshire. You've got to do that. And in rural areas, it really counts because, because a half an hour road journey can make all the difference uh, in the quality of care, the certainty, the security people have in their old age. We've, we've got to get it right. So, so I, will, I will certainly support that. Absolutely. Okay, Amanda Benham, followed by Julie Beaumont. Hi, Boris. Um, you've right. been avoiding head-to-head -head debates. In the words of Mrs. Thatcher, are you frit? Aye. On, on and if you are frit, are you fit to be Prime Minister? Well, I'm, come on. I think I've never. I don't think anybody could have done as many hustings uh, as I have done. And one, uh, one of the one of the one of the important things, and, and indeed encounters in the in the in the media, I think one of the important things is uh, not to, as Conservatives, not to spend too much time. Uh, tearing great lumps out of each other in, the, in advance of uh, the, the end of the project. And, um, if I, if I, my, 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 my policies and, and so on have, have, have received a, a huge amount of scrutiny. Uh, what, I, what, I what I will say is uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of a fellow conservative. Uh, that is, that's my general approach to life. But, but you are only doing two head-to-heads with um, Jeremy Hunt. Only? Well, two in a, in a six or seven week campaign. That, here doesn't, I that am. doesn't strike me as very many. I, here I am talking to the people in the, in the South West uh, who are, after all, uh, the electorate. And, and, I didn't, and, and by, your own, uh, by your own admission, I'm doing at least two head to head debates, which I think is probably more than enough to glut the appetite of the. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think people. I think. I did, I've done loads of debates in my time, loads and loads. And I remember, I remember, I, I did, I did oodles with Ke with Ken Livingston in particular, and it went on and on, night after night. And, and, and then we discovered that people were literally switching off. I mean, they were they were appetite for this stuff, and and you know they want to screen it prime time. I I think people have got have heard quite a lot already. Uh, they're going to hear quite a lot more, and they're going to hear lots of debates, lots of hustings, and be able to make up their minds. Um, right, Julie yeah. Beaumont followed by Sally Stevens. <coughs> Morning, Boris. Morning. Um, please, can you tell me what your policy is on tackling illegal immigration? Illegal immigration. Well, it, when it's illegal, uh, people should face the consequences of what they do uh, in, in law. And uh, we should be catching them, and we should be, I'm afraid, we should be sending them back. Um, that, is the, that is the way to, to do it. I don't, don't wish to sound inhumane, uh, because I'm generally quite pro 
immigration by talented people and always always have been. But if they're breaking the law, then then clearly that that is a that is another matter. And uh, I think as a country, we've had spent a long time where we've where we've allowed. Um, a, a lot of very, very experienced and clever lawyers to uh, interrupt the process of, uh, of return uh, so, so that it, it becomes very, very difficult to send people back to, to, to whence they came with the result that more people come. And it's a, it's a very serious, very, very serious problem. So um, I would be, my, my general approach would be tough on illegal, uh, but making sure that we remain an open economy to talent. And I, I must be very clear about that. I, I, I don't want to slam the, the, the gates of, of Britain to everybody. And I speak as somebody who's, you know, whose great grandfather, I don't know if you might have seen my father there in the front row. Uh, my, my great grandfather came here in fear of his life from Turkey. And, and, you know, if, he, and if Britain hadn't then been an open and welcoming country, um, well, I don't know. He would, he would have probably been assassinated slightly earlier than, earlier than he was. Uh, so, so, you know. Um, what, what, what about people who aren't necessarily necessarily highly talented because we know that a lot in the rural economy the rural economy li relies a lot on uh, immigrant labor seasonal labor that's right and that's why you need an australian style points based system to sort it out what you what you need is a it, 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 there, there is no doubt our economy is is a fantastic diverse growing economy and there are sect there, the, if you look at the the rural sector there are unquestionably uh, farming communities uh, that do need seasonal labour. Uh, and, and it's gone on for, for, for decades, if not for centuries. And uh, I remember on, on, on our farm in Somerset, there, was, there would be, there would be uh, people who came over from... Uh, say again? Withypool. that's right, not from Withypool. <laughs> they, they didn't come just from Withypool. <laughs> they, they, they came from France or from Switzerland or, or, or wherever uh, on, a, on a seasonal basis. And that's, that's, in, that's entirely right. And uh, you should, but you should do it according to the needs of the, of the economy. You should do it according to the needs of the, of the sector. And I think what has gone wrong with the current approach is there's been no control at all. And nobody's known on what basis people were coming in. And they, they were able to come with no jobs to go to and no sense that their, their particular skill was actually required by the UK economy. So once you have control of your immigration system and you have a points-based approach, I think the most important thing you, you then have is democratic consent for what is going on. And that was, that was in very large measure what the Brexit vote was all about. People just didn't feel they were being consulted or they didn't feel that their elected politicians were in charge. Well now we're going to be in charge and we'll have a system that actually reflects the needs of the UK economy. And 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 you know we don't just have people coming in without jobs to go to. You're quite liberal on immigration though, generally aren't you? I, am. um, that, that I saw on Twitter, so it must be true, the other day <laughs> <laughs> the other day that um, when you were Foreign Secretary, you met a lot of European ambassadors and you said to them that actually you didn't have a particular problem with freedom of movement. No, that's completely untrue. That was, that was, a, that was not true. That was a, that, I remember that was a, a breakfast meeting, briefing that, that I did uh, with them and uh, they produced an, a, a, a wholly distorted account of what I had said. I do. I think freedom of a, 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 a fallacious account. I do think freedom of movement does not work because it is... Uh, there's no control. You have, you know, what's the population of the EU? 580 million uh, people who are technically allowed to, to come and go as they please, to treat the UK as it were as their own, as their own country. And I, and, I, and I just don't think that was working for us anymore. We need to have a system. Yes, we can be open. Yes, we can be generous. Yes, we can be opening. But it needs to be democratically controlled. And that's what we're offering. And that's the way forward. Right. Sally Stevens followed by Steve Smith. Uh, which failings, as, as a minister, can you learn from the most as PM? Well, uh, <laughs> boy, I think I think I, mean, I mentioned I mentioned my my disappointment over over Skripal, and I mean I think that probably is the single thing I remember. I I, 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 I was I really thought that it was possible to eyeball the Russians and to get a new relationship, and. I was very optimistic. I went to Moscow, actually in sort of in defiance of, 
have a lot of advice. I try to uh, build a new uh, friendship and a, and a new partnership, and it just it just isn't there. There's you know all this stuff that Putin comes up with about you know uh, liberalism is over. He's wrong. He's totally wrong. Our values, freedom, democracy, the rule of law, free speech, those things are imperishable and they will succeed. And I, it was, and I, I just thought, I believe that so strongly that I thought it must be obvious <coughs> to the Russians. And in the end it wasn't. And we, we're just going to have to wait and, and, and recognise it again, as with Iran. You know, Putin is not Russia. There's a young generation of Russians who are going to want to listen to a, a new message and who are going to want to engage in a different way. And that's where we should be focusing. That's where British diplomacy should be focusing as well. Is it, is it possible to be idealistic in terms of foreign policy? Or were, were you constantly yes. confronted by harsh realities? No, I think it, it's not only possible, it's absolutely essential. People in this country have no idea how much we are loved and valued around the world for what we do and for, for our values. So there are people, in, even if they're not in power, there are people in politics around the world who look to the UK, who listen to what we have to say, whether it's about female education or about human rights or free speech, and think, well, at least somebody's sticking up for these things. Somebody understands what I'm campaigning for and what I believe in. And it is incredibly important that we, that we do it. So, and, you know, and, and I know that people say we shouldn't be spending so much on, on overseas aid. And, you know, I'll, you know, a controversy you haven't even asked about that I'll wade into. Um, yeah, I think that some of it probably could be much, much better spent. And I'd like to see it spent uh, delivering British political commercial objectives. But it, it delivers massive results around the world. And we should be very, very proud of the good the UK does. And I think it would be a very sad day if we were to seem, be seen to retreat from our global engagement. And that is not what Brexit is about, is it? Brexit is about producing a global Britain and not a, a narrow, uh, narrow, uh, what's the word, introverted uh, approach to life. That so won't work. Since you waded into that, just very quickly, 0.7% on international yeah. aid, you're, you're committed to I, I, that. I am. I, I, will, I, will, I will defend that if and only if we use that funding to promote our commercial, uh, diplomatic and political objectives as well. And that seems to be only reasonable. Other countries do that. Uh, I was, it was incredibly frustrating to be in, I think, uh, in, in, in Myanmar and to, and to, and to, and to find that the, the Japanese were beating us hollow when it came to uh, getting contracts for, for railways because they were prepared to underwrite uh, their exports and, and their companies in a way that, that, that we weren't. And I would like to see us being much more proactive in supporting British business abroad and being much more dynamic in, in our approach. Okay. We've got 10 minutes left and I've got five questions here, so let's see if we can do two minutes a question. Um, Steve Smith followed by David Do you want me to pad it out to two minutes or do you want me to... Do you want, we could have some more questions if you want. We could. Let's see if we can get through it. All right. Morning, Boris. How will you run your government? Sofas or boardroom? It will be a team. Uh, and it will, be, it, will be drawn, it will be a very widely drawn team. I don't know whether it will meet in... A, it, does, it doesn't matter where it meets, but there, there, there is a... Uh, as I say, a, a big uh, constellation of talent available now in the Conservative Party. I don't think I've ever known a time when the Tory party had so many brilliant men and women in Parliament. Uh, we will draw from all uh, sections of the, of the party to take us forward. And uh, I would remind you the way I ran City Hall, it was with a fantastic chairs, many of whom were women, of course, and I believe passionately in advancing uh, that agenda as well. Would you commit to 50% of your cabinet being... Made the difficulty with that, Ian, is that um, we don't have 50% representation of, of women in, in, the, in the Conservative parliamentary group, and I think that would be invidious uh, at the moment. All right, well, but, what about the 30% as it is in the parliamentary party? Well, uh, I think it would... You know, I'm not going to give some quota at the moment, but we should definitely be advancing, definitely be advancing the interests of women in parliament and in government, and if you... If you want to look at how I do it, look at my team in City Hall, because it was virtually a sort of 
you know, feminocracy. It was really, it was work, really work well. But it, it, is your instinct, though? Right? I mean, you, you're quite an informal person. Is your instinct to sit someone down on the sofa or sit across the cabinet table from them and be a bit more formal? I think this is the most trivial question I've been asked. Well, <laughs> I, I think I do it for I, a living. No, I understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I think it probably depends on what kind of conversation it is going to be, <laughs> and whether there is going to be coffee or not. Okay, let's move on. Um, David Kerr, a very different question, this, and then Peter Walsh after David. Morning, Boris. Morning. I think you might have answered, part, partly answered this question already, but given the large amount of working people using food banks, would you divert overseas aid budget or part of it to help them? Well, I, I, look, I, I, I understand people's strong, strong feelings about this. I, I think people who help run food banks are wonderful. When I was running London, we did, I, I helped set up loads of food banks, and they're fantastic things. Uh, and the answer is, of course, to make sure that people on lower incomes get more in their packets, their pay packets every week. And that's why I, I championed the living wage and expanded it so much. The country as a whole particularly people on, on low incomes, need a pay rise. We're totally honest with you. We, we need higher pay, not higher taxes. That should be, that should be our, our approach. And it, you can do it. You can do it. And the way to do it is not just through things like the, the living wage. It's through, it's through better skills, higher productivity, all the stuff we've been talking about earlier on, about investment in transport infrastructure and, and broadband. All those things will help to drive up uh, investment and drive up uh, incomes as well. That is, that is what we should be doing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, higher pay uh, for, for those on uh, lower incomes is, is crucial. That's why I think it was in the Times piece this, this morning. I, I said, I've said what I said about lifting thresholds uh, for national insurance uh, for those on low pay as well. We've got to do that. Too many people on, on very small incomes are paying too much in tax. It's simply not right. Peter Walsh, followed by Gillian Whitelaw. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, bearing in mind the quality of the two candidates, will whoever is successful bring the other into their cabinet? And if well. losing, what position would they like? <laughs> well, I, again, I mean, I think this is one of those very, very difficult and invidious questions because, uh, y y of course, um, there, is a, there is a wealth of, of, of talent on the, on the Conservative benches, but anything I say now uh, about uh, the future shape or, or, or personnel of uh, of, of the administration I lead would, would be counted as measuring the curtains. And um, I just don't think we're yet in that position. But Although I, 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 I hope fervently to count on your support and to get over the line, I just, I just think you know, there's a long way to go. But it would be normal for the winner to um, put the second place candidate into their cabinet, wouldn't it? I mean, that's always happened before. Uh, not with Dave and DD, as far as I can remember. Um, but. Well, that was Did a bit it? slightly different circumstance. He put him in the shadow it. cabinet. Did he? Yes, shadow home secretary. I mean, you're right. I worked for him. I you're know. right. You're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, okay. Well, perhaps I could just cut to the chase by saying by saying I have a very very high regard for Jeremy. And but you're uh, not going to guarantee him a job. I'm not guarantee. Well, okay. I'm not. I, All right. I, let's I, move I, on. I, I know. I, well, what I will say is is that your 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 previous comment, which in your 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 analysis, which are, which in your, you're right. It sounds to me uh, eminently fair and, 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 and logical, but I am not making commitments to anybody. You nearly got that. But I'm not making commitments <laughs> to anybody because you would not expect that. Okay. I will ask that to Jeremy as well. Um, Gillian Whitelaw followed by Keith Cottrell. Uh, Gillian. Uh, good morning, Boris. Given the emergency, the two emergency loans totaling £6.2 billion, generously made by the Treasury to Ireland after the 2008-09 banking collapse, has the Irish PM been asked to repay the loan in the light of continuing intransigence over the backstop? Well... I, 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 I don't believe that uh, that issue has been raised. Uh, but I, I, want to, look, I want to say it is very, very important that we get this right with our friends in, in Dublin. And, of course, 
Uh, we've got to be sensitive about the issue of the, of the Northern Irish border. But I, I would just say to you that I think it can be done. And I think what it needs is a, a, bit, of, uh, a, a bit of confidence. And uh, we need to look at the technical solutions that all sides agree are practicable and deliver them in the context of the, the free trade agreement. And we will engage uh, absolutely uh, generously and openly with our friends and partners in, in, in Dublin. Uh, I, I, we won't be using that kind of tool of uh, negotiation because I, I, we want, I hold out the hand of uh, friendship. And I, I, I recognise how, uh, how important getting it right is for, for Leo, for Agha and, and for Dublin. We will be very, very consensual. We will work with them. But what is absolutely non-negotiable, we will not have... We will not have, under any circumstances, a hard border in Northern Ireland. We will not have checks at that border. And the whole of the UK will come out of the EU entire and united without in any way prejudicing the government of Northern Ireland. And we will get it done. And it will be a, a great success. And we can work with our, uh, with our friends and partners in Dublin to do it. Now, if you answer this next question in less than two and a half minutes, shall we take our life into our hands and take a spontaneous one? Yeah, of course. We should take any number of spontaneous Right. Questions. Keith. Good morning. Yes. Are you committed to ensure that all animal welfare legislation, as it currently stands in the EU, will become law in the UK post-Brexit? Uh, yes, I am, Keith, and I would go further and say that leaving the EU will actually give us the opportunity to uh, intensify some protections, and I would, I would point out, uh, for instance, uh, life transport of, of animals to the continent, uh, where, we can, where we can do more, and, and we should. Uh, there, there may, there, and, and, and there may be other things uh, as well. Uh, there are areas where, actually, I think the spirit and feeling of, of, the, of the British people is very, uh, animal sentience, for instance, the spirit and feeling of the British people is very much in favour of protecting animals and protecting animal welfare, where there are sensible things that we can do, uh, then that, that go beyond uh, the current framework, then, then, we, then we should do them. Right. Who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Gentlemen. Yeah. Right. One in the front row, if we can get a microphone here. And let's have someone over this side, because I think you've been a bit neglected. There's a chap in the front row here. Hello, Boris. Thank Sorry. you. No, no, no. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to hear the Come on, get on with that message. Yep. Okay. So, uh, Huawei, uh, will you commit Huawei. to looking again at Huawei, Huawei. and standing yeah. firm with our US and Five Eyes partners and saying no to Huawei in our security network? Well, uh, I'm very, very dubious about anything that compromises our security. Uh, you know, I, obviously, I don't want to pitchfork away investment in our country. And I, I've been a help to attract a, a lot of investment from China, from India, around the world into, into the UK. I'm very, very proud of it. But you can't, uh, and it may be, it may even be, that there are useful things that can be done in infrastructure. The Chinese, as you know, are uh, heavily committed to, to Hinkley. You know, uh, we, we've done that. But, as you rightly say, we should not be doing anything that will deter uh, cooperation with our most valuable intelligence partners, the Five Eyes. Uh, that's where, uh, and, I, and I really saw this as, as Foreign Secretary, but, uh, with responsibility for the, uh, the agencies. You know, this is an unbelievable relationship. Uh, we cannot afford to put it at risk. Right, final question over here. Would you be for or against extending the franchise to 16-year-olds? Giving the vote to 16-year-olds. How old are you, sir? 17. 17, right, OK, OK, right, right. Well, you've only, got a, you've only got a year. You've only got a year. But you're allowed to vote in this thing, aren't you? Can you? Yes. Yeah, well, there you go. I think. I, think. I don't know what the rules are. Can you vote in this? Can you vote in this? Fantastic. OK, well, I'm not... OK, well, that, well look, I mean, that, that's a start. That seems, that seems to me... That seems to me... That, you know, a, a, a lot of... A, there are, you know, a, who would like to vote in this contest. Uh, so congratulations uh, on that, uh, on your foresight in becoming a, a member of our party at this crucial time. Um, I, I'm, 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 uh, and, and let's encourage many more people to join, by the way, uh, because it's a, it's, a, it's a great party and a great time to join. But I tell you what, I'm, I'm not that attracted to, to reducing the, uh, the age of the, of, of the franchise just because I want, I, want, I want people to value their votes. And uh, I think that, you know, 
18, year, 18 years, um, you know, we don't get enough 18 to 24 year olds voting, uh, let alone 16 year olds voting. I'd like to see the 18 to 24 year olds really using their vote before we, 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 we lower the franchise downwards. Let's, let's value our franchise first and let's, let's encourage people out to the polls uh, whenever they come. And in case I forgot to mention it earlier, uh, they're not going to come anytime soon if I'm lucky enough to be uh, successful. We don't want an early election. We want, we want to do, we want to get Brexit done uh, by October the 31st. We want to unite our party, uh, unite under a fantastic, progressive, modern, conservative agenda, and then, in due course, in the fullness and richness of time, we are going to wallop Jeremy Corbyn for six. So, so basically, you're going to wait for an election to allow this young gentleman to vote. That's the message. I, my, my intention, sir, is that you should be able to vote in the next general election <laughs> by some, by, by, by some way. Right. It's a gentleman who's determined to ask a question, but we've gone two and a half minutes over our time. I will give Jeremy Hunt the two and a half minutes as well, because that's uh, obviously fair. Uh, Boris Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll just have a couple of minutes before we reset things and then we'll come back. But don't rush to the loo because it will only be two minutes.